Today is Sunday, August 1st, and this is Tokyo Daily, the Olympic show from the Toronto Star. I'm your host, Brendan Dunlop. Can you believe it's August? Can you believe the race Andre de Grasse ran? His fastest 100-meter time ever, and he took bronze Sunday morning in Tokyo. Without Usain Bolt at these Olympic Games, we knew the throne was there for the taking. And Lamont Marcel Jacobs from Italy took it. But de Grasse, what a run. He overcame a slow start with a blistering final 30 meters to finish third and become the first Canadian to take two Olympic medals in the 100 meters. And he's not done in Tokyo. It took Penny Alexiak two Olympics to become the most decorated Canadian Olympian ever. A bronze medal in the pool in the 4x100 meter relay was her seventh Olympic medal. And you can see how much it meant to her to share it with her relay teammates, Sydney Pickram, Kylie Moss, and Maggie McNeil. She'll fly home with a medal in every color. McNeil won gold in the 100 meter butterfly, silver in the 4x100 meter freestyle relay. Just incredible what the Canadian swim team did in the pool. Six medals. With all they went through, all the time they spent out of the pool because of pandemic restrictions, particularly in Ontario. And Penny Alexiak, she battled back issues, injuries since becoming a teenage superstar in Rio. Just incredible that she is now the most decorated Canadian Olympian ever, and she can head to Paris in three years. With just the personal goal of adding to her incredible total. The United States took silver, and Australia won that 4x100 meter relay event, making Emma McKeon the first female swimmer to win seven medals at the same Olympic Games. Michael Phelps, Mark Spitz, and Matt Biondi, the only men to ever do it. Emma McKeon had herself a games. Canada's women's basketball team had a tough game again. They lost their last group stage match, 76-66. Before you went to bed, they dropped it to Spain. So one win and two losses coming out of the group. That means they'll be scoreboard watching today to see if they've done enough to advance to the quarterfinals. Spain were in control for much of this game. Shot 59% from the field, Spain's six foot six center, Astu Endur, dropped a game high 20 points, loads of easy layups too. A series of turnovers, missed shots, had Spain open up an 18 point lead at one point. So to have just lost by 10, that differential could be massive because here's how it breaks down. Let me get into the math for a second. Canada, a plus seven point differential after three games. So they're scoreboard watching because France, currently sitting third in Group B, have a plus 21 differential right now, but they do have to play Team USA in their last group stage game. Australia, third in Group C, with a minus 17 differential, and they're going to beat up on Puerto Rico. In Tokyo, it's three groups of four that make up this 12-team tournament, meaning that Canada could go through as one of the two best third-place teams. Kia Nurse has really yet to play at her best. She put up 14 points against Spain. In the sand, the Canadian women's beach volleyball duo of Heather Bainsley and Brandy Wilkerson pulled off a big upset. They knocked off the favorite Americans in Kelly Clace and Sarah Sponsel to reach the quarterfinals. So they could meet gold medal favorites, Canadian duo Sarah Pavin and Melissa Humana Paradis in the semifinals. But back to DeGrasse, who ran his personal best 989 to take bronze in the 100 meter. Very happy to go back to Tokyo and chat with Dave Feshik of the Toronto Star. Dave, how you doing? Brandon, doing great, man. How, how's it going for you? I'm okay. I'm okay. It was an early one for Canadians to wake up and watch Andre DeGrasse finish third in the 100 meter. What did you think of that, Dash? You know what? It's uh, not a completely unexpected result, right? I know everybody uh, was hoping for better, and I understand that. You know, the, the, the tradition of... Uh, Canadian sprinting is uh, is considerable, and, uh, and DeGrasse has shown incredible promise through his, uh, you know, remarkable rise from from that kid uh, in Toronto running in basketball shoes and baggy shorts to the to the uh, to the incredibly accomplished uh, Olympic uh, medalist that he is now, four time Olympic medalist that he is now. But uh, but you know, I was I remember talking to Donovan Bailey in the lead up to these Olympics, and, and Donovan was. Uh, very complimentary of the of the Italian gentleman, uh, uh, Lamont Marcel uh, Jacobs, who who won gold and and really pointed out that uh, Fred Curley, who ended up getting the, the silver, you know, had had been very uh, very good this season without really putting a full hundred meters together. So uh, I'm not saying Bailey called the shot. I do think he actually had a lot of belief in in Andre de Grasse's ability to pull one out of the hat here. Um, but let's face it here. I think Andre DeGrasse's best shot at something better than our bronze is going to be in the 200 meters. And, and it's probably going to be in the four ball 100 meter uh, relay with his uh, teammates from Canada. 
Yeah, that's right. I spoke with Donovan Bailey uh, yesterday on my CBC show, and we were, he was saying on and off air how he really thought you know, Curly was the threat. You could tell. He really thought yeah. Curly was the biggest threat. But I think for a lot of people, this field was wide open, which made it so exciting. You saw the, the, the British uh, runner get disqualified. Um, there was so much attention on, on the Chinese runner in this race. Um, to see Andre de Grasse in the, in the last bit there, they showed the, you know every 30 meters. Um, he, he really turned, turned on the Jets in the end. And to run in lane nine is not easy. No, I, especially, you know, with uh, the guy, the guy in lane eight pulling up lane mid race, that can't help you. I wouldn't think, uh, you know, I remember, yeah, talking to uh, Donovan, you know, he's a great resource, obviously. And, and talking to Donovan's people, I did a pretty long retrospective on uh, Donovan's 25th anniversary of his 1996 gold in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, speaking to his coach, Dan Paff and his, uh, his main man is chiropractor, physiotherapist slash uh, uh, miracle worker, Mark Lindsay, who really got Donovan up from a really uh, devastating injury only a few weeks before that Olympics uh, and, and got him to the start line um, in Atlanta. They all talked about how in the heats, you know, it's so important to your point. It's so important in the heats to uh, in the semifinal to get a spot in the middle of the race you want to be in lane four, lane five, I believe Donovan won from lane six and uh, in Atlanta. So, yeah, I don't think, I don't think lane nine is an ideal spot. And obviously it spoke to, you know, probably performance he, he wishes was a little better uh, in setting up the final. But as you mentioned, he's got his eyes set on, uh, on uh, other events, uh, still at track and field. The, the, being this weekend was weird for me. You know, we're used to the 100-meter dash being on the final weekend of the Olympics, the, the last Sunday. It's kind of the, the crowning moment. I kind of feel like the organizers got this one wrong. Do you? Man, there's so much wrong about this whole thing, right? Like, yeah, okay. It's so wrong to – like, I walked into that stadium the other night. I was lucky enough to be there when, when Mo Ahmed uh, made that incredible run in the 10,000 meters – uh, at Tokyo Olympic Stadium, and it's such a bizarre—it's uh, such a bizarre backdrop for a track meet, right? To have this massive, gorgeous stadium, it's a beautiful place, uh, but to have it lying empty uh, for these athletes is is just so strange and so so kind of apocalyptic, apocalyptic almost. And and some of the greatest, you know, man, I've been lucky to be at a handful of these things, Brendan. And, and, you know, the, the, the thing you always look forward to is the moment when the electricity in a, in a packed Olympic stadium turns to the, you know, pin drop silence of the moments before a hundred meter final. And we just were robbed of that, right? We didn't, we didn't get that tonight. And the, and the athletes really more importantly, forget us, the athletes didn't get that tonight. And you wonder how it affects things. You'll, we'll never know how it affected people. The, would Andre de Grasse have been better if feeding off the electricity of a crowd? He does seem like a, a you know, he's not, he's not Usain Bolt, but he's a, he's a showman in that, in that sort of vein, right? He, he enjoys playing to the crowd. He obviously enjoyed playing to Bolt when he had that chance to run with Bolt. Um, and so we'll never know how the race would have gone if there was, you know, 60,000 people in that stadium. But uh, we do know how it went. Uh, with, with the stadium being empty and it didn't feel right. Yeah, Donovan Bailey said he couldn't imagine running a competitive race in an empty stadium. He very much fed off of that. I asked uh, Alex Depati the same question about diving in an empty aquatic center. And he said, well, that's how we train. So for it to be a competition, you'd be aware that it's a competition. It'd be strange for it to be empty. But mentally, the adjustment would be different. I think for for sprinting, it's, it is such a show. You can tell that they, they feed off of it in a certain way. And that, that was absent uh, at these games, which has uh, definitely been a theme uh, across the board. But um, for... For Lamont Jacobs, I mean, and for fans of track and field, it's wide open in the in the men's 100 meter dash department, which has got to be exciting for for Diamond League when that gets going again. It's exciting for Italy. I mean, first Italian, fastest man in the world, right? And uh, I mean, I'll be at born in El Paso, Texas, but it doesn't change the fact that he's uh, that he's you know he's Italian and he, and he uh, grew up in Italy, and 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 look at him now. Well, uh, let's talk about Erica Weeb. That's your story in the Toronto Star this morning. You were there as she was uh, eliminated in the, in the first round. Um, just such a difficult uh, run for her in preparing for these games and, and defending gold is, is difficult in normal situations, but this was anything but for Canadian wrestlers. Yeah, I mean, look, Erica Weeb, uh, 
you know, we know her as that sort of gleaming, smiling face of, in a lot of ways, of this Canadian Olympic team. She was one of the marquee, marquee people uh, coming into Tokyo, no doubt about it. She's She was one of the people who did the best in the wake of the Rio Games, uh, having won the gold medal there. She got some sponsors. She was able to build a profile uh, and good for her. Uh, turns out we didn't know the half of the struggle she went through uh, to get to Tokyo. And of course, today she lost uh, in the first, very first match to, to the competitor from Estonia uh, at May. And, uh, you know, six minutes after five years, Brendan, you get six minutes of wrestling. And that's all, Erica, we've got. Because uh, even though she would have had a chance in the repechage to get a bronze, if May had advanced uh, beyond the semifinal, uh, you know, May lost the very next match to the Japanese, which essentially eliminated Erica Weeb. So, yeah, very tough go, not only because I think the way Canadian coaches have spun it and the way Canadian athletes have spun it, not only think it's spin, I think it's legitimate. Canada had tougher restrictions than basically every country on the planet, uh, certainly the wrestling planet. Um, so while the European competitors that Erica Weeb uh, and, and her colleagues in Canada are, uh, were going to have to face the Olympics. We're training in training camps with 10, 10 12 nations together at, at a time while they were traveling more freely than Canadians. You know, Erica, we've talked about how she spent some of the off season uh, outside the World Cup circuit shadow wrestling, which is, by the way, wrestling with nobody, <laughs> wrestling, wrestling with an imaginary opponent. Uh, you know, she said there's some value in it, but it's obviously not the exact same thing, not even a reasonable facsimile of, of wrestling a sweaty, muscular, you know, you know, uh, you know, incredibly athletic opponent like the one she wrestled today. So and then on top of that, Erica Weeb was uh, who you know had not mentioned in the lead up to Tokyo, at least to my knowledge, she had not mentioned that she had suffered an, an incredibly long list of injuries, including two strains uh, of various knee ligaments and a really bad ankle sprain that had her in an ankle boot only about a few weeks ago. So not a particular, uh, when you, when you take all that in, in retrospect, it, I guess it wasn't a particular surprise that, you know, she did not repeat as a gold medalist. Repeating is always difficult. Uh, it seems like it was going to be a lot more difficult for her given all those circumstances I outlined. Yeah, so so much for her to have to have gone through. So disappointing to see it come up so short, as you mentioned. You know, would work for five years and see it all go away in six minutes. Um, but really, uh, the shadow wrestling. I mean, I've I, I don't know about you, but uh, the shadow writing is something that I, I've I've tried a few times. Ah, it's all in my head. It'll come out when I finally get to the, yeah. the keyboard or to the pen, and it just it doesn't translate. It doesn't work that way. Uh, let's finish up quickly uh, on, on rowing. You were you were at the regatta to see the the women's eight rowing team um, win go uh, win a medal, and uh, when we were speaking before. Yeah, you said the pressure was really on rowing here, the rowing team yeah. sending their largest contingent. The, the pressure was to return return medals and uh, to come home with a gold in women's eight after uh, a medal the day before is pretty good for the rowing team. Yeah, that's that was pulling one out of the fire because this was the second Olympics in a row, Brendan, where the women's eight had been asked to sort of redeem a pretty disappointing regatta. Uh, five years ago in Rio, I was there when you know they had one medal going into the final day of the regatta. It was a silver lightweight double um and and that was not enough for for a, a program that gets 20 million dollars in quadrennial funding from on the podium that's right up there with swimming and, and and athletics and swimming and athletics are bringing medals and rowing hasn't been uh five years ago in rio the women's eight was asked to sort of redeem a pretty disappointing regatta they couldn't do it they came fifth uh this year they were asked to do it and with three holdovers from that Olympic team, uh, that Olympic eight, they did it in style, man. That was, that was a th thrilling race. Uh, they won the gold, knocked off the reigning world champions from New Zealand. And, and maybe even more satisfying, they knock off the United States from the podium. The uh, United States, of course, had won three straight gold medals in women's eights going into Tokyo. And this, uh, they, they left Tokyo having not won a medal in any rowing race uh for the first time since 1908 i mean speaking of pandemic oddities there's one for you in the rowing world um but man it was touching for for me anyways i mean for for those of us who remember the glory years of of canadian rowing 
92, 96, when they won a total of uh, 10 medals combined over those two games, of course, led by Marnie McBean and Kathleen Heddle, who won three golds over that span in various events, including the women's eight in 1992. Uh, for these young women of this eight to uh, cite the inspiration of Kathleen Heddle, who, of course, very sadly died in January at age 55 after a really long battle with cancer. Uh, to, I mean, I was, I, was, I was choking up listening to these girls talk about that after the race, talking about how they heard thunder in the distance. And they said, hey, that's Kathleen. She's cheering for us. She's, she, we are going to bring the thunder. We are the storm, I think, was the words they chose. And, and they rode like it. And they backed it up. And, and that's, what, that's what you're supposed to do when you get $20 million of well no podium funding. You're supposed to be the storm. Uh, and you're supposed, to prov- you're supposed to deliver. And I know it always doesn't work out. Uh, but it's, it's a glorious thing to see what it does. I'm glad you got to be there for that. I mean, Canadians watching at home could definitely see the emotion when they, when they won gold and crossed the finish line there. So to hear the backstory behind it, I'm glad to, that you were able to tell it. I know you're busy out there, Dave. Your work has been great in the Toronto Star, uh, writing from Tokyo. So thank you very much for jumping on Tokyo Daily with me. Brennan, always a pleasure. Hope you're doing well. Check out Dave's piece in the Toronto Star on Donovan Bailey. It came out on Tuesday. Just Google the headline, Donovan Bailey won the 100 meters in the Olympics 25 years ago despite a devastating injury. His secret? Relax. What a story. The front page story in the Sunday sports section featuring a great piece from Bruce Arthur about how the athletes have saved these Olympic games. And look for his piece from the Olympic Stadium after DeGrasse's bronze medal as well. Gymnastics has got the spotlight on Monday, but Simone Biles won't stand in it. The six-time Olympic medalist won gold in the floor exercise in Rio, but has opted not to compete in Japan. And is the story ongoing. Wake up at 4 a.m. because that'll be the story. Watch Canada's women's soccer team. They're in the semifinal against the United States. Will Christine Sinclair and company avenge their heartbreaking semifinal loss at London 2012? As Diana Matheson has repeatedly said, the officiating has been good at this tournament, so Canada has a fair shake. Hope you think this is a fair show. Thanks for listening to Tokyo Daily. Watch us on YouTube every single day during the Olympic Games on the Toronto Star's YouTube page. And thanks for subscribing and liking us wherever you listen to your podcasts. My name is Brendan Dunlop. I'll talk to you tomorrow.